Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining our talk today, uh, which is titled Youth Involvement uh, in Environment and Climate Action. So this talk will be in English, first of all, but please feel free to engage with us and ask questions in the chat section uh, in Arabic, if you want. We, uh, half of uh, us here are uh, Arabic speakers. Uh, my name is Rachel Trabulsi, and I will be moderating this event organized by the Greater Middle East Platform. The platform is an independent, is independent and it brings together a diverse range of Dutch Middle East experts. It's, uh, it wants to make green partnerships central in international cooperation and trade through one of its main initiatives, the Green MENA Network. This network was created to map sustainable actors to connect, facilitate, and cooperate for a green future. So uh, please note that uh, you can share your questions in the chat section. We might share also some links for your reference. Uh, ask questions uh, in the chat section. We will answer them in the end. Uh, I think we will have time for that. Uh, and again, feel free to ask them in Arabic. Uh, this session will be recorded. So we can post it later on our platforms for whoever couldn't attend uh, today. Uh, but only the speakers will be showing, I mean, uh, in the recording. Uh, yeah. So let me start. Today, we are going to talk about the work and efforts of youth movements in the Middle East that are, that are addressing the ever increasing threat of the ecological crisis that the world is facing. We are going to look more into how young people in the MENA region are connected to their environment and to the land, how they address climate issues and the challenges that arise from their contexts. That's why we have with us three amazing speakers. First, Yara Dowani from Um Sulaiman Farm in Ramallah, Palestine. The farm was born in 2016 as an effort to reimagine resistance as a community effort rooted in the intersection of the social, economic, and environmental. They have been operating since its inception as a community supported agriculture farm, mobilizing community resources to support farmers on the ground. Second, Maha Yassin is a junior researcher at the Planetary Security Initiative at the Klingendale Institute. Her work focuses on raising awareness and catalyzing action on climate change related security risks in the MENA region. Iraq is a planetary security initiative focused country where Maha contributes to dialogue initiatives to engage local stakeholders. Last but not least, Nishad Shafi is an environmentalist and social change advocate. He holds a master's degree in energy and environmental engineering and is based in Doha, Qatar. He was distinguished in the apoliticals list of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy 2019. Nishad is the founder and the executive director of the Arab youth movement Qatar. Welcome Yara, Maha and Nishad. So uh, I'm going to start uh, asking Yara the first, uh, giving the floor to Yara in the beginning. First, Yara, a Muslimian farm posted not long time ago. We see farming as an ecosystem that could produce a healthy society, not a machinery to generate profit at any price. Could you tell us more about how a Muslim man is working towards a healthier society? How are you engaging young people on the farm? Tell us a bit more about the benefits of a literally hands-on approach in the ground when it comes to environmental and climate action. Um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So I'm going to be speaking about Imsiman Farm that I've been part of for the last uh, three and a half years, more or less. Uh, I think the most important part of the farm that we're all young people that uh, like Imsiman didn't pick us. We got attracted to the farm and we got stuck there. Most of us came as volunteers and we were amazed of the the lifestyle that M. Sliman uh, offer us and the empowerment and the satisfaction. Most of us actually who work at the farm went on education, we traveled, we did our master, we worked with the lo like local NGOs or international NGOs, but we ended up being at the farm. 
and I think that's the most empowering part of the farm. Um, I wanted to show a video of the farm because it gives you an introduction. Uh, we did this video because we're launching our crowdfunding campaign, but it gives you a, a background about the farm. It's, it's three minutes long. Uh, I'm gonna show it to you and then I will be talking more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. screen okay do you see my screen yes okay you, can, know, uh, you cannot hear the sound yeah oh good ردواني من مدينة القدس احنا اليوم موجودين في مزرعة ام سليمان في بلعين غرب رام الله مزرعة ام سليمان تأسست بال2016 من قبل محمد ابو جياب مهاب العالمي وهي بتختص بالزراعة المدعومة مجتمعيا اللي هي بتوصل المزارع مباشرة مع المستهلك او الاعضاء احنا بنوفر سلات غذائية بشكل اسبوعي من خضرة عضوية بيئية خالية من اي مواد كيماوية صحية للانسان وللارض احنا بدينا بالنا انه كون عنا وعي كيف منزرع منزرع زراعة متنوعة كتير أصناف مرات منزرع أشياء بس لأنها منيحة للتربة مش عشان تغذينا نعمل على إعادة بناء التربة نعمل السماد تاعنا الطبيعي نغطي التربة بالقش عشان نحميها ونخفف استعمال ماي نزرع شجر أعشاب ورد فمش بس خضار وكمان نهتم بالتعليم الشعبي يعني حاول نعمل ورشات عمل ودورات وتدريب لموضوع الزراعة وموضوع البناء الطبيعي كمان احنا موجودين طبعا بمنطقة سي بالعين كتير قريبين من الجدار ومستوطنة فبالتالي ممنوع نعمل اي بناء او اي منشأة او حتى السياج او حتى خيمة ففي دايما خطورة انه يتعرضوا هاي المنشآت للهدم ما بنفع كمان نسيطر على الموارد المائية انه يكون عنا بير او بيرك تجميع مياه غير انه الارض كتير صخرية ولما بلشنا ما كان فيها اي تربة او تربة سطحية فيها مغذيات فاضطرينا نجيب كثير اشياء مدخلات من الخارج عشان نقدر نزرعها شكرا لكل اللي دعمونا في اخر خمس سنين استطعنا نستصلح خمس دنمات اراضي من اصل 15 دنم ونزود 30 عائله بسلات غذائيه المرحلة الجاية رح نستصلح خمس دنمات أراضي عشان نضاعف الإنتاجية ونستقل مادياً ندعوكم لتكونوا جزء من مسيرتنا نحو السيادة على الغذاء في فلسطين Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you notice that all the people in the videos who are not only people working at the farm, but also volunteers, friends, 
they're mainly all young people and I think that's uh, something very empowering about the farm that we're not intentionally trying to seek young people and putting so much effort there. Young people are seeking us uh, and I think it comes from uh, the same reasons why the people work at the, the farm came to the farm. Me personally, I did my BA and I worked with the, a normal NGO and I, my beginning was a permaculture course for two weeks. And there, I, I, it made so much sense for me, especially in our context in Palestine with all the, the occupation and the challenges, it makes so much sense for me to grow my own food, manage my own place and try to learn uh, how to manage our resources because we're always, uh, we, it's not available for us. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, for me something really important, and uh, also the 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 point that the farm attracts Palestinians not only from the West Bank or Jerusalem or the north. It's a point that bridge uh, Palestinians to come together, especially that. We have three people working at the farm. I'm from Jerusalem, someone from the West Bank, and another person from the north. And they, we all bring our people. So we end up having this platform to learn about the society that we got really separated uh, from each other uh, by the Israeli occupation. And we don't have space to meet usually in normal life. So this uh, place as a farm, people come and volunteer. Um, it created this space to come and work together and learn about each other life and each other challenges. And I think for me, that's what uh, I'm happy to see always at the farm. And also the owner of the land, the land doesn't belong to any one of us because we cannot afford to buy land in Palestine. So luckily we find the landlord and he was really happy to give us the land for free in order to regenerate it and to work on it uh, for the society. Um, so yeah, to also not have the feeling of uh, owning something, uh, makes it available for everyone. It doesn't belong to me or anyone who work in it, work in the farm, even as if it's a volunteer owns the farm and owns the effort and the harvest also of the farm. Um, I wanted to talk um, also about the community supported agriculture model that we uh, implement in the farm, which is basically connected the, connecting the farmer to the consumer and uh, in my opinion, it's a, one of the most uh, successful models for farmers because it, it, uh, uh, the challenges that usually farmers have is marketing, having money in advance before the season, uh, knowing how, how much he has to produce. So with sub community supported agriculture, you know how, how many families you have, they pay in advance. And then I don't have to borrow any money. I don't have to to worry about where my products will go. And we've been following this model for uh, the last six years. We started with eight members, eight families in Ramallah. And now we're uh, doing 40 or 50 even in the next uh, winter season uh, to produce uh, organic vegetables and products. Is a potato. Yeah, sorry for the disturbation. Um, yeah, and but yeah, I, I think it's important to talk about challenges because it all sounds so romantic and nice. And <laughs> usually people when they ask, what do you do? I tell them, we, I work in a farm, ah, so cool. And no, it's, <laughs> it's cool, but it also comes with a, a lot of challenges and especially where we are, I don't know, you've noticed in the video, the, the wall, the settlement with an, in an area that uh, you're not allowed to build or to save your own water. Um, so I think it's really important always when I talk about the farm to talk about the challenges because it's part of our daily life also. We're a, a group of young people who never studied agriculture. Uh, we learn through experience, we learn from each other, and we face a lot of challenges because also uh, living or working in a farm means that you don't have a stable income every month, like when you work for a company or a bank or whatever. Um, also, you don't always 
like the nature is your own calendar. You, you cannot not go to the farm when it's too hot or too cold or turn mm. on the condition outside. Uh, we have high cost of inputs. We, we suffer a lot from finding local uh, resources also uh, from uh, compost or organic seeds. We try to give the best quality for our, our customers, but we're always um, yani suffering in finding these good qualities. Um, and also the people in the villages um, in the farming area have have been in the last few years heading towards university jobs careers uh, and on the opposite no in all the world now people from the cities want this community land let's buy land and settle uh, so also this movement, uh, it's positive and negative because sometimes I want people from the same village to work with us or people part of the farm. Uh, but we are all from cities at the end because people in the village want to uh, study and be a doctor and architect, which I understand why. Uh, but I, I think also it's important to find a middle ground between the people from the city and the village that we don't end up buying their land and moving to their land and people from the village end up being uh, moving to the to the cities uh, because throughout the years agriculture have been looked down to uh, it's not uh, appreciated it's not being uh, uh, respected also as a career or as a something you do or a lifestyle and i think it's really important to empower farmers because we all need to eat at the end and we all uh, appreciate eating good and healthy uh, organic uh, or without any chemicals and in order to keep this healthy lifestyle that we all seek we need to empower farmers um, and i think there's a big movement now in palestine in the middle east in the world uh, in the youth to go back to the land and regenerate the land and live this uh, lifestyle and I think it's really important as consumers, because farmers at the end, they, they uh, produce what the demand asks them to produce. So if we are, we are all consumers, if we are aware of where our food comes from, who produce it, uh, the condition that it, it went through, uh, then the farmer will also be empowered to produce healthy and organic and uh, something that is good for the humans and for the nature itself. Mm. Um, Do you want me to talk more or do you have a question or something? Uh, the, I'll leave the question to the end. Okay. Uh, are you done or do you want to add anything uh, else? Or not? I think I like to get uh, into the question later on because then more uh, conversation okay. will come up. I gave and I think... Although, I actually, I, will, I can ask something now. How do you keep those young people that you're talking that they came from the city with a certain background, you know? How do you keep them in the farm? What? Uh, is Um Sleiman doing to convince those people? I can't keep them to... out. <laughs> you, can, you can keep them out. Yeah, I imagine. No, no I, 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 it happened to me also when I joined the farm. It was like, ah, I'm here for one season, yeah. twice a week. But I think it's really, um, it's the sense of satisfaction that keeps you in the farm. And you cannot imagine yourself again in an office or again working for another uh, system, mm. let's say. In the farm, you're uh, responsible for yourself. You produce your own food. You produce mm -hmm. food for another 40 families. You're in nature. Uh, you organize yourself. You educate yourself. And I think this is really something that we missed in schools, universities, uh, cities also. Uh, and you're always learning. Like For me, what was fascinating about uh, nature or agriculture that every plant is a universe. So. There's always this feeding, nurturing, mm. you're always learning, uh, you learn how to solve your problems. There is no one telling you, no, you're doing something wrong, you know? Yeah. So I think it's really the feeling of being empowered, independence, um, free also, mm. you're free. Because yeah. here in Palestine, we're under occupation, we don't feel the freedom in any moment, you know, in movement, in daily life. In the farm, you feel free because you're the, your own, uh, producer let's say you, mm -hmm. you're, you're you're 
you're seeing life also when you work with plants you see life all yeah. the time life and death it's a cycle and you're very in contact with the nature with the climate with the with the cycles of the seasons mm-hmm. with all the tough moments yeah. but when you're in the city i always feel neutral or bad a bit but uh, in the farm it's uh, i i you appreciate the, mm-hmm. what you do let's say with the hard times and the also successful times. All right. Thank you, uh, Yara, for your presentation. Uh, so yeah, we saw how young people in Palestine are moving to a healthier way of living. Um, they're staying in tune with their, with their land, despite the lack of resources and, and the many challenges uh, that they face on a daily basis under occupation. If you have any question for Yara, please write them down in the chat for later. Uh, now we are going to move to another context, uh, Aira, with Maha Yassin. So Maha, Aira is face issues such as water shortage, water contamination and pollution, among others. What are the threats that this brings on the Iraqi community and youth? And how are you, a youth movement tackling that? Can you tell us a bit more about environmental campaigns by young Iraqis and the role of media in achieving environmental objectives? Thank you, Maha. The floor is yours. Yes. Uh, maybe, Vanessa, can you pin maybe Maha? So she's, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Rochelle, for organizing this uh, important discussion and for having me. And I think it was quite inspiring uh, to see and uh, listen to your efforts in Palestine. Um, so as you said, I will zoom in, uh, to, into Iraq and I think the, um, in general, environmental and climate change activism is relatively a recent movement. And this is uh, mostly because the country was going through a lot of internal and external conflict. But the conflict itself has also worsened the impact of uh, climate change and gave rise to the exploitation of the environment. You know that for many years, the uh, government main effort was uh, focusing on stabilizing the country and also to improve the the economy of the country. Most of the investment of the government went towards the oil sector. And uh, with this, the, uh, the other sector like water, for example, and agriculture was neglected to, to a great extent. But um, I do not want to talk about the problems. I think um, anyone who goes to Iraq can see uh, how the land is is turning from this endless date palm orchard in, into a desert. But um, I think I think it's important to. But still, with that, I think it's important to understand why how this gave rise to um, environmental uh, activism in Iraq. Um, in general, the scale of this movement is still small, but also growing very fast. And um, at the Planetary Security Initiative, or PSI, uh, we have been in contact with uh, several NGOs and uh, found out that there are only a few of them who are doing very hard work, on, like greening campaigns and environmental monitoring. Uh, and these are like led by the youth uh, and, and, and they rely a lot on volunteers. But although there is like only few of these organizations, there is also a lot of interest from other actors um, like uh, local government and uh, for example, in the South of Iraq and also academic institution, they all want to support and work with these uh, organizations which is something I think the NGOs in Iraq really need uh, because you can, as an NGO, you cannot achieve much on the ground unless you cooperate with the government and with other institutions, also international institutions, of course. Um, and, and this is what, what we try to do at PSI. We try to foster this cooperation between all these stakeholders and actors. And with this limited resources that these uh, young NGOs, uh, most of these org- organizations actually rely on volunteers, as I said, and on social media to, re- to reach to their local audience and to promote their activities 
but I think most importantly to raise awareness of what is happening. And I can say that for raising awareness uh, is the most activity that they are involved in. And, um, and as I said, like they, uh, they do these campaigns uh, which, and the campaigns and also monitoring of, of how, for example, the oil industry is affecting their environment and what the government and authorities should do in response to it. And there is like a, a good response from the government to this, but it's still not to the extent that changing what is happening. Mm. And so, as I said, it's, it's evolving that their activities, it's evolving and developing. And uh, the first thing that these NGOs started, like it was, it was only in the cyber uh, world. They only uh, focus on raising awareness on social media and they expanded their outreach, for example, not only Facebook, which is very big in Iraq, but um, they start to use Instagram, for example, and also uh, Twitter. And the first phase, let's say, was mostly to get them more volunteers and a small fund. And the second phase was implementing a project because now they have volunteers and they have small money to do something on the ground. And they also started doing that with promoting their activities and in the hope to get international exposure and also international interest in what they're doing. They are still, of course, in uh, combi combining awareness raising with activities promotion, but they also require a lot more of international support. You know that most of them are young people and they are looking to build their own capacity and currently, currently they have access to this uh, very affordable tool, social media, uh, to make their voices heard. But they also need more support to reach decision makers, for example, and to collaborate uh, with them to make change on the ground. And um, finally, I would like to uh, ask Silva to show a small a promo video on what we are doing at PSI. And this is an activity that we did this summer with uh, local stakeholders on how to foster cooperation between them to affect decision makers in Iraq to make better policies to protect the environment and um, response to climate change. Can you make it bigger, maybe? Thank you. 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 of climate change are really quite bad and everyone certainly when you live in the south of Iraq can see this on a daily basis how the desert is growing how it's pushing farmers off their lands how it's forcing migration into the city المساحات فقد بلغ 6 ملايين و 906823 دونم بما يعادل 95% من المساحة الكلية لمحافظة البصرة
last years and decades showed that we, we see a rapid increase in their frequency and intensity. They are affecting individual livelihoods um, as well as the stability and security in the region and they affect these, uh, the current situation in an unprecedented way. We are witnessing in Iraq as well as in other places in the world that climate change and environmental degradation is unfolding here and now. مشروع العتبة الحسينية لو أخذنا يعني مشروع فدك هذا تم إحياء الفيدونم في مناطق قريبة من بحيرة الرزازة هذه الفيدونم تم زراعتها بالنخيل وتم جلب أكبر عدد من أنواع النخيل الموجودة في العراق ومن خارج العراق من أجل الاستفادة منها وإحياء مزارع النخيل في العراق بعد الأضرار التي تسببت بها الحروب طبعا استجابة المجتمع كانت استجابة رائعة كل مكونات المجتمع رجال ونساء شيوخ وأطفال رجال دين مدارس جامعة العسكريين يعني إحنا لما لما رحنا نساهم في تشجير القاعدة القاعدة الجوية أو أو أي وحدة عسكرية فشوف أكو أكو تلاحم أكو تلاحم مع هذه الحملة لأن لا نحن نعمل على عرض فعلا. We see climate change not only as a security risk or threat, but above all as an opportunity to cooperate, to work together to combat saltwater intrusion, plant trees and climate smart irrigation. Okay, Maha, you want to uh, add anything? Yeah. Yeah, so to comment uh, a little bit on the video, um, as you see, like the video is focused more on what PSI is doing, which is climate security, but we also see that, uh, which is, th we think that it's, an, it's a new topic that we want to present uh, in Iraq and to educate people that it's not only ISIS or terrorism that is threatening the security of, the, of people over there, but it's also climate change. And we hope by this that we can bring the attention of, of authorities in Iraq to actually t take the, the issue more serious. Um, and yeah, with that, um, I, I, would, I would thank you and looking forward to listening to the next speaker. Thank you, Ma. Thank you uh, for telling us a bit more about uh, Iraq and uh, how young people are, are uh, creating movements and using the media to raise awareness and push uh, the social and environmental uh, agenda. Uh, so now we are going to move to another local yet a bit global example of youth engagement, uh, this time in Qatar uh, with Nishad Shafi. Uh, Nishad, Ever since the inception of the Arab Youth Climate Movement, uh, Qatar, it has grown to become one of the most effective and wide-reaching environmental organizations in Qatar, where you focus on reawakening the ecological consciousness of the community. So uh, we were talking before, and you told us you were at the Youth for Climate in Milan, and uh, and the, the activist Greta Thunberg opened her speech by saying and referring to world leaders' talks and promises as blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and she added, if this is what they call climate action, then we don't want it. So how does the talk translate into local concrete actions that young people want? We are very excited to learn about the grassroots what uh, work that the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Qatar is doing in regards to pushing Arab youth involvement and the needs of the region on the map of these global movements. Nishad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, uh, Green Network Mena, for this opportunity to share our work uh, with, uh, the, with our participants here today. So very well said in your um, uh, speech, uh, yeah, Rochelle, that we, we, we do hear a lot of uh, promises, but uh, commitments has to become the highest level from the government 
And of course, it doesn't stop with the government. A lot of role has to also to be played by our civil society groups and especially young people in making our leaders accountable. So with this, um, Arab Youth Climate Movement was started back in 2012 when uh, Qatar hosted the COP18 here in Doha, which much of the people in the region have never heard of, unfortunately, uh, even though it was one of the biggest events happening in the region. So it was it, the problem was it was born, but never survived until it started and regenerated again in 2015. So I will just give a brief of what AYCM is, what we do, and um, our work and our team. So you get a glimpse of what we are trying to achieve, what have been achieved, et cetera. So here is like a very beautiful logo of um, Arab Youth Climate Movement. The grass shows that how grassroots level uh, things we've been doing, that's super rooted to the ground. So the idea is what, uh, uh, how Rachel mentioned, we are trying to build up ecological consciousness in the community as Arabs in the region and the Bedouin community were deep rooted with their tribe and environment, which has been completely forgotten in the, in the, over the years of development and massive uh, development, especially in the Gulf region of the Middle East. So that's why Arab Youth Climate Movement was formed in 2015. And we were fortunate enough to be registered as a nonprofit association in 2018. So the idea is actually to work on raising environmental grassroots level, targeting young and adults, and are seeking to be, you know, a, being the informed voice about environmental and ecological issues in the region, not from the government perspective, but the community perspective. What do you think about what is happening at the grassroots level? So unlike most of you here, much of the things happen from the government level. So we wanted to work in our own way, where community works on scientific research, development of knowledge, et cetera. Uh, the idea is also to come actively involve community in doing so. So we, we, we wanted to work on bringing uh, reports, making public lectures, using social media, which young people are very much interested in these days. So that was the whole idea of having Arab Youth Climate Movement in Qatar. Of course, the vision and mission is to build and empower our community in understanding the local ecosystem uh, and also to how we can use evidence-based policy to adapt, mitigate our current ecological crisis. So we do this by doing a lot of programs. So we created a shared vision for the country's ecological future and also engaging young people in co-creating solutions that are very much fitting to the local environmental problems rather than, you know, you talk about global, but rather we, we emphasize on what we can do very locally. And of course, also at the same time, advocating for behavior and policy change to sustain grassroots campaigns and policy briefing and reports. Of course, there have been a lot of challenges of what the problem you're facing in the endless exploitation of environment has caused a lot of uh, loss of biodiversity, exhaustion of natural resources because of continuous uh, use of it over the time. And if we go at this phase, of course, uh, the health, public health is the uh, main issue where we will be facing. And like the pandemic also opened the vulnerability of the health sector as such. Given the climate change, health would be one of the key priorities of governments to look into. A lot of fundings have been now been pushed towards that too. And also lifestyle. I mean, Gulf, Gulf states are known for extraordinary Gulf uh, lifestyles. So it also have to impact their lifestyles, behavior changes, of course, and the economy. Of course, given the fossil fuel industries are more occupied in part of the Middle East and uh, most of the dominant Gulf countries are fossil fuel based countries at the moment, economic diversification would be key for a sustainable future for this region. So um, we are currently working on producing ecological, uh, so a more holistic educational education for young and adults, and also sustained campaigns within the community. So we have come up with the three areas where we actually work in uh, through an advisory board. And uh, we also uh, look at fundings, which we receive through CSR funding or other activities where we do joint projects. We also look at institutional partners. We have been working in the past many years with many institutions who are providing us capacity, as well as helping us to develop uh, programs locally. So we have a, a lot of research interest as such. We are not just into campaigns and advocacy on social media. We work on projects on the ground as such. Uh, we are looking and uh, focusing on interdisciplinary research, which combines engineering, political and social science, and as well as um, economy and policy and humanities and community-based. And the research also involved in intervention programs, also to develop evidence-based policies through research tools and method. Um, the research topics are mostly we work on policy and which are of community relevance. So these are the main areas we, we are, our research interests are into. 
So I'll move into some of the, some of the ongoing community projects, of what we call our talk series, Ambassadors of Involvement and Eco Literacy for Imams. Our talks is sort of a high level speaker event where we, we used to invite uh, in the past before in the pre-pandemic times, international speakers, activists, uh, UN diplomats to come to Qatar and meet public. Why have you choose that? Of course, the answer is that most of these uh, events would be in the past was only confined to universities or government events only where public doesn't have access to. So what we try is to make something on a public library that everybody gets an access to talk, understand. What are the issues the region has been facing? Not just the polar bear we see in Antarctica has nothing to do with us in our country, which is desert. So we wanted to showcase that your country is also going through massive transformation, which is ecological issues uh, from desertification, um, marine, um, uh, marine uh, ecological issues, um, uh, salt water intrusion, uh, sea level rise, which are not even discussed at the, uh, at, the, at the very highest level and the temperature rise. People are talking about temperature rise, heat waves in, in the European countries. It is being told under the current 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, if there's a change in temperature, it would be twice in the Middle East, which has also been told that even in coming decades, the region would be in inhabitable. And where are this discussion? And where are our young people leading those discussions, which is quite uh, uh, understandable given the dynamics and politics of the region. That's why we started Ambassadors of Environment to train our young people to be that leader in the community, to understand the science of climate, and also that um, uh, to bring those subject to more developed narratives around the ecological uh, issues and how we can have environment friendly life. So we started our initiative last year. That was our first program during the pandemic time. Uh, we, we train 20 young people, and this year we are happy to collaborate. We are doing it with the support of the British Council here in Qatar, so we've been growing uh, uh, quite big. Uh, the program has shown a lot of interest from young people uh, for a position of 25 ambassadors for a one-year uh, training. Uh, we received a massive 360 application, which is quite big for a small country like Qatar. So we've been hoping for more young people joining in the upcoming year too. And Eco Literacy for Imam is a quite interesting, interesting project we've been started with AUKAF, the Ministry of Religion, where we'll be training Imams in the mosque to talk about um, environmental changes in perspective of uh, Hadith, which is the religious teaching, and Quran, which is a holy um, book of uh, uh, Muslims. So the idea is to use the Jama Kutbah, which is the Friday prayers, after the prayer that it is to be used to talk to them and how community feel about in perspective of uh, religious way. So now you have seen a lot of talks about how religions can be uh, integrated in the environmental conversation. Uh, just the other day when I was in um, the, when the Youth for Climate Summit in Milan, a pop gave a video addressing to the youth uh, telling how religion has to be on the forefront in advocating their disciples to take necessary actions in the community. And also I heard there is a huge coalition of uh, um, um, religious leaders coming to COP also to have the faith-based uh, support for actions uh, locally in their respective countries. And the ongoing research projects uh, are at the moment is um, Greenhouse Gas Emission Battery of Qatar. This report was recently launched in presence of, uh, I mean, virtual presence of UNFCCC Deputy Head, Ove Sarman, which was quite um, important and evident. Our work has been um, highly valued and we, we, we support, uh, we, 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 we thank the UNFCCC team for supporting us. We're also at the moment working on um, a consumption based inventory also, and also ca household carbon footprint. The household carbon footprint is a first of its kind uh, footprint uh, survey, activity survey, which will be launched in Qatar in, in a few weeks time. Initially, it was a small project of our own. Uh, just to uh, update that the project got a lot of support. Uh, we also able to raise up to 100,000 USD to get this project rolling and the support of Ministry of uh, Education, Ministry of Public Health, and also Supreme Committee of Delivery and Legacy, which is the um, the local organizing committee for the upcoming FIFA World Cup here in Doha. So the idea is to measure the footprint for household and we will be doing it through the support of the schools where every individual from the school uh, students would be taking up this survey. And that's why we involve the Ministry of Education because it will be a mandatory program for every individual in the schools to take this take part in this survey. The survey is a lot of an activity based one rather than numbers which we were looking at how much a household would be producing as a carbon footprint. Given the fact everybody has known Qatar has the highest carbon footprint in the world, but not knowing where exactly it comes from. So we would be identifying those and pro providing evidence-based campaigns to reduce those footprints. 
And we're also working on a uh, role of private sector uh, transition to low carbon economy. We're working with Qatar Chamber of Commerce and International Chamber of Commerce on doing how Qatar's uh, industries can be moving toward transition to low carbon uh, through workshops and also design thinking in the coming days. Of course, pandemic has slowed down many of our programs, but we are, um, we are coming back given the fact restrictions are removed in much more in Qatar. And also looking at SMEs, that is small scale industries, um, sustainability framework, how young people who are starting up their industries can work on uh, sustainability and how that can be part of their larger industrial growth, keeping in mind environment as the key factor. So that's what uh, we've been doing here in Qatar over the last five years. This is, uh, this is the team which I should be thanking for supporting all through this work. It's not a one man show, it's a team effort. We are very happy to have a great team, of course, by all means, uh, we are well empowered by the number of women in our team, so I'm very happy to share that too. Um, this is our scientific advisory board. We have been always been supported by Dr. Salim ul -Haq, Dr. Dabia, Dr. Rabi Motar, and uh, Dr. Mickey Pinston, and Dr. Mr. Joe Rabbit from University of Manchester. Uh, so we've been, you know, quite supported by, you know, not only our advocacy, but also from policy and uh, research works to making sure that our voices are not just voices, but concrete action on the ground. So we've been working with our partners, including UN, UNESCO, Qatar Foundation, Qatar National Library, Yangu, UCAM with UNESCO, Climate Action Network, SOA, Social Good, and Global Shapers. That's it. Thank you. Some of the glimpses of uh, support we received. Uh, also to mention, this wasn't uh, until three years of our work. It took a lot of time to build our credibility over the years. So now we might see all the tweets and uh, uh, um, posters supported by the state as such. We've been also got the greatest breakthrough in 2019 when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs invited our uh, NGO to represent Qatar at the first UN Youth Climate Summit in uh, New York uh, during the UNGA. So it was a quite an accomplishment for us and uh, our team has been also quite uh, active participants since COP21 to COP25 in Madrid in 2019. So, and we always do a lot of community activities inviting, you know, uh, leaders from all the stake of life. So we do awareness videos, we do sort of, uh, um, uh, what do you call uh, releases, some message based videos. Uh, of course, we use all channels of social media to bring people's uh, awareness on the climate issues. So that's it. Thank you so much uh, for the team, Salvia, Rachel, and Vanessa for inviting. Uh, looking forward to the question. And also, thank you to our wonderful fellow panelists here, uh, Maha and um, a colleague from Palestine. Uh, keep up your good work. Amazing projects you've been doing. Good luck. and looking forward to seeing your more work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nishad. Uh... For your presentation, uh, showing the work, the efforts that uh, the, the Arab youth uh, climate movement Qatar is doing on local but also global level. As you said, we need to engage young people in co-creating solutions to reach environmental targets, which leads me uh, and us to uh, the question session, because I see a question from Paul Arts, which I wanted also to, to ask in a way um, about um, uh, the, the, the cross-border collaboration uh, with Iran, for example. So as climate change is a cross-border phenomenon per definition, do the friends from Iraq and Qatar interact with their peers in Iran? Um, so um, I don't know if uh, Nishad, you can answer this, and maybe also uh, Maha, if you have uh, anything to add. Oh, well, I mean, um, we, we will be happy to, I mean, beyond the regional politics, I mean, we've been always a political in our approach to uh, raising youth voices. Nevertheless, you know, any regional borders was in our concern. Uh, we always spoke as Arab youth, as the name say, not only just mentioning Qatar, but as a youth from the region. We found the vacuum of young people at the global scale, not only for work at the local level, as well as showcasing our young people's work, because the narrative always we hear in the media is um, global north young people are going to save the world. Now it's um, completely rubbish and uh, it is a collective work of all the young people across the globe and uh, everybody's inclusion is absolutely necessary in order to make um, our governments accountable. So I think I, I don't, I don't, I foresee you no know, collaboration with all the youths uh, nevertheless beyond the, beyond the borders. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Maha, would you like to add anything or do I move to the, uh, another question? Um, yeah, like a, a small comment. I think um, Iraq and, and Iran um, like has been like going through negotiation, especially on, on the water issue. Uh, but the negotiation was on the government level. I am not aware of any collaboration like on an NGO level uh, between Iraq and Iran. Uh, but academically, yes, there is like some kind of negotiation, like conferences. Uh, but water in 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 the region, as uh, as Paul mentioned, is uh, is a really a big issue. Like Iran, especially the southern part, is affected as Iraq. And uh, this summer, there was also a lot of protests and conflict between citizens and the government, and uh, which it also happened in two thousand and eighteen in in the southern region of Iraq. So. Uh, the government is trying like to find a way to to uh, allow more water shares getting into uh, into Shapalara, which is the main river in in, in Basra, but it always uh, come into a negative uh, result because Iran um, also has the right to hold the water because they are also affected. But yeah, I mean. I hope to see in the future that there is more cooperation, especially in the level of NGOs. And um, uh, in PSI, we hope that we can also uh, f facilitate or, or foster this kind of negotiation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Yara, there's a question for you uh, from Silva. Uh, so your work is very down to earth in the farm. Do you also spend time connecting and collaborating with young farmers in neighboring countries or in the global eco-agricultural movement? Um, yeah, yes, with as individuals working at the farm, we're part of other groups, uh, voluntary groups who work to connect farmers with consumers. We do a farmer's market. We um, also in farms, you in the beginning of seasons, you need a lot of help, physical help. So many people come to help. Uh, we have some farmers around. They don't produce in an organic way, but we have good relationship with them and they see the farm and they see that's working. So hopefully eventually they will transform also. But also you, you have to take in consideration where are, uh, people from the city you cannot just come to a farmer who's been working in the land for the last 40 years and tell him ah, you're doing it wrong or don't spray this and that. I think uh, the most important uh, thing is to be stable as a farm and to prove that you are doing it well and uh, for farmers the most important part is to make money also. So we are trying to reach this level which I think we are there uh, before we can uh, intentionally and uh, like try to transform other, other farms to organic farms. But yeah, we are um, part of a movement, which is a small movement, but it's a very powerful movement of young people who are trying to start initiatives and farms and trying to be active in natural farming and uh, these kind of movements. Okay. And uh... Yeah, do you, do you see the, the shift to uh, organic farming like slow, happening slowly? And why isn't it uh, happening? What, what, is, what, what is the, the, from what perspective do they, the farmers think they're uh, usually? I mean, it's obviously to, to produce more and not to kill, like to have a yeah. more income. But like when you talk to them, what is their... Uh, I think it's uh, originally as Palestinians, we, we grow food naturally uh, before. Now people are heading into monoculture, greenhouses, production with a lot of pesticides. Um, and I think it has to make sense for the farmer that he will make more money or the same money by following these uh, techniques. Mm. Uh, and I think with this, we need to be very confident with our uh, uh, way of transforming this knowledge. So. I would say that in the first few years we were test like not testing but getting established and uh, getting our knowledge to, um, documented before we 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 head to farmers and uh, speak to them. But the the challenges is it requires you to be full time in the farm. It's not like monoculture or chemical agriculture. You cannot just plant things and when you have a disease go to the uh, 
uh, shop and buy a medicine. You have to be there. You have to connect with the land. You have to observe. You have to to need you need people to be there all the time. And I think this is one of the main challenges that people uh, now maybe the old people are doing farming and they, their children are going to universities or having jobs. So it has to be efficient and practical and also money-wise uh, convincing. And that's, I think, one of the most uh, important barriers. And with the growing movement of organic or natural farming, when you see more farms and more projects doing it and producing it, um, more and the demand of consumers, as I said before, if the consumer doesn't demand healthy and good food, the farmer doesn't care what, because usually farmers have a farm for their family and farm for consumers. Uh, and I think if the demand doesn't ask for healthy and good uh, organic products, the farmer wouldn't bother. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the participants, by the way, if you want to also uh, ask speakers directly, feel free to raise your hand or write something in the chat and we'll unmute you. Uh, it's nicer to have also not me being the, <laughs> reading the, the questions. Um, but meanwhile, I will ask uh, Maha a question. So Maha, you, you said, you mentioned that um, um, youth involvement is uh, happening on a campaigning level, you know, and you're uh, equipping them with the right tools in order to do that. How do you see the role of youth expanding beyond campaigning uh, or using social media? Yeah, I, I think uh, we already saw some some advancement. As I said, it's evolving. It was first like raising awareness. They are they they've been doing this for a while already, but they were able to raise small funds and they were approached by um, just people want to help out. So now they are doing like these greening campaigns. They go like to places, they invite people to do plantations. And so this has started to happen, but it's still like not as big as, as uh, happening like in other regions, for example. And this is mostly because of, because of lack of funding and um, they are mostly counting on locals to fund them. And I think like the, the, their role um, is is to be able to lobby with the government to to have a, like a, a professional expertise in that field in that field so they can affect the government to pay more attention to to what is happening uh, on the ground mm -hmm. uh, to put more like uh, uh, to have more adaptation and mitigation and mitigation effort to, to climate change I think this is this this is the next role that they can involve in but. Um, there, there is still um, capacity lack in that field among the young people and activists in, in Iraq. Mm. And do you find that there is acceptance also from the government side if uh, young people go protest against that? Uh, are they usually faced with violence or how yeah. do you face with these challenges? So, so um, activism in Iraq, uh, like sometimes... Uh, is viewed uh, negatively by by authorities uh, uh, because uh, they think they are disturbing the fragile security in the country, and of course nobody wants this, especially the government. But it's happening because there is a very small response from the government. The, that's why people started to protest, especially the young people. And of course, the government says that we we do not mind that you are protesting; it's your right. But there are other uh, groups uh, who are actually targeting these activists and actually few of them were killed and mm -hmm. the rest they flee the, to to Kurdistan region because they are feel more safe over there so if they want to do something big and influential they will have to face um, like uh, other other consequences that could threaten their life that's why now their activities is still like uh, not very big and they're trying not to uh, blame others they're trying to do it by themselves they, they they took the matter by their hands they're they're doing this raising awareness and planting and greening campaigns 
Um, so they moved away from blaming the government, but eventually this is not going to do much. As I said, like they need to work with the government. It's need, it has, there should be like a cooperation between activists, government and other international organizations to actually make something happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. So which leads me to the last question um, Vanessa asked it. Um, yeah. So how can we in Europe support young climate activists in the MENA region? What help is counterproductive and what is helpful? Uh, what you're saying, you need the international support, you know, but what, yeah. what is uh, the need? Uh, in that well, I think, I think giving them a platform to, mm -hmm. to raise their voices, this is like a very great help. So what you are doing now, um, is uh, we we of course try to convey their voices, but we also need to hear from from the people who are affecting and who are doing the work on the ground. So like Yara, what she's doing and and Najib, but uh, it's I do understand it's very difficult to to reach to them, and maybe the language is is also another barrier. But like giving them a platform to speak, to talk to to talk about the challenges they face and what they want to do. This is like one way to bring support because funders and donors can hear them and can interfere. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is like um, a one way to help out and also um, building capacity. Like when we when PSI went there and we talked to the people, especially the young people, they say, we went training. We want to be trained. We have like limited knowledge on this topic because it's it's really not uh, in the radar even of the academic institution in Iraq, you know. So they say we want a training, we want to learn more, and um, of course they they look up to Europe, for example, because it's way more advanced in this field. Mm. So I think this is also another uh, way to support activism in Iraq. Okay, uh, uh, and uh, Yara, Yara, from your perspective, uh, what? How do you see? Uh, uh, Europe or, or uh, you know, uh, the West supporting in the, in the mission of the farm and the mission that you are uh, working on? Um, good question. I think just by um, getting more aware of what's the situation in Palestine and to support Palestinian farmers who are on the front line, to be aware of the situation here, uh, meaning the occupation and the restriction and how does it affect our life, to, to change your perception about Palestinians also and people who live in the Arab countries. Uh, support us, I would say, by boycotting Israeli products also and supporting more Palestinians. Um, and visit us, come to visit us and get to know us and volunteer at the farm. Uh, yeah, that's how I would say. Do you have volunteer like uh, some programs or? Uh, we already? have usually a lot of volunteers, but with the COVID, we uh, <laughs> 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 we're waiting for yeah. the borders. But yeah, we have more Palestinian volunteers now, which is also good. But we used to have always volunteers from all over the world, and it's, it's really nice to have a lot of people coming. Nice, beautiful. And Nishad, uh, would you like to add something? How would you see like the international community supporting the movement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would um, echo what a uh, colleague um, mentioned here, Maha mentioned, like uh, it's sort of um, providing a platform like this where you, you counter here from both the regions and what exactly they can push our leaders because they're on a better position to uh, through trade rules or the, the foreign policies, they can definitely push a lot of things. And of course, in how young people, of course, giving a platform for young people, I mean, the, the whole youth movement is in the global north. I mean, we need to support the most vulnerable in the global south, including the, the, the West Asia region as such. So I think um, the, the best way is to providing a platform, amplifying the voice of young people in the region, and also through the through the government channels to push, you know, through European Union or the respective uh, uh, countries back in the European countries can push through their foreign policies and also a trade relationship. Yeah. So that will be the best way doing going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. Then I think there's not uh, more questions. No more questions. 
I will uh, close the session by first thanking you uh, all for being here with us. Thank you for the lovely speakers and for the participants. Um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, this uh, event has been recorded, so uh, you can share it with people who haven't been able to attend. We will do that on our platforms, uh, uh, YouTube channels, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, if they're uh, not going to cut, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> but we have YouTube, so, <laughs> and the website, of course. There's going to be an article also written. Uh, our next event is going to be held also in the end of the November, so stay tuned for more information. It's going to be about the EU Green Deal and uh, the, how it affects the MENA region. So it's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wish you a very good evening, very good day from wherever you are. And uh, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>